cybersecurity? There's a ton of content out there, and if you don't know where to start, it can be overwhelming, even paralyzing. So let's fix that. Welcome to Simply Cyber, a community of tens of thousands of aspiring and active cybersecurity professionals focused on networking, knowledge sharing, and professional development. I'm Dr. Gerald Dozier, Chief Content Creator at Simply Cyber, inviting you to get the answers to your cybersecurity problems with hundreds of cybersecurity videos answering your frequently asked questions, interviewing industry experts, and live streaming daily cyber threat briefings hosted by me. Now get the stories and insights you won't find anywhere else. Hit subscribe now and dig into all the fresh content on the channel and in the community. Nothing should stop you from launching and leveling up your cybersecurity career today. All right, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to the show. Today is Monday, October 16th, 2023. Welcome to episode number 473 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Gerald Osier. And over the next 45 minutes, me, you, All-American Rejects, Boban, Franklin Camp, Marcus Kyler, In the Wind, Leon Elliott, Leo, Lyle Martin, Seabright, VJ, all those over like Alex Goodwin, Luke, uh, Luke Canfield, Omatola, James McQuiggan, who I'm going to be presenting with later this week, LinkedIn, YouTube, squad members, cybersecurity community members, first timers, long timers. Guess what, everybody? It's inclusive and you're part of the show. We're all going to be shredding the top cybersecurity news stories of the day. And I will be giving my opinion, some might say expert opinion and analysis on each of those stories on what it means to you as a practitioner. So how can you operationalize this to bring the cyber risk reduction to your business stakeholders? Or if you're looking to break into the industry, believe me, you're going to get massive value from the stream. Holler at me. You're going to be covering top, you know, threat actors, current events, policy. Ooh, GRC. It is Halloween time, people. Spooky GRC. Might even be cool. But the deal is, you're going to be asked in any single uh, cybersecurity job interview, how do you stay current? Believe me when I tell you, this show will prepare you to not only answer that question, but to be able to follow up with a response that's intelligent, uh, value add, and really impressing the interviewers. So stay tuned, become part of the show. Believe me, you'll be uh, glad you did. Now, before we get into the stream, let me say shout out and thanks to the stream sponsor. Start with my good friend, Eric Taylor, with the uh, pop-up chats here. Um, uh, Eric Taylor over at Barricade Cyber Solutions. Listen, Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping um, Businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. But Barricade Cyber Solutions knows how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. Believe that. Check them out at BarricadeCyberSolutions.com. Leon Elliott with the gifted sub. Can we just become best friends? Yep. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, uh, um, Leon Elliott for that. And whoever got that gifted sub, who got it? Jaya, recipient of the gifted sub. Also want to say shout out and thanks to Panopsi Security. Get a partner who understands. All right, hold on one second. Get a partner who understands your cybersecurity program and your business goals. Panopsi Cyber, uh, Security can help you if you are looking to build an information security program. Put one together. Go from reactive to proactive. Regardless of what your budget is, what your industry is, Panopsi Security can come in, write the ship. Think of them almost as like a, v, uh, a fractional uh, CISO where they can come in, set you up, and move you forward, and everybody wins. All right. Also want to say shout out to uh, Anti-Siphon Training, but more about them at the mid-roll. All right, guys. Remember, each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing is worth half a CPE. Oh, Jerry, I don't get out of bed for less than one CPE. What are we doing here? Believe me. Half a CPE is uh, unmistakable. 
Second of all, if you're here on the regular, you're going to get more CPs than you know what to do with over the year. They stack two and a half a week, 10 a month. Be sure to say what's up in chat. Hashtag team live. If you're here, what's up, War Goons? What's up, Divine Dream Divine? Guys, say uh, hashtag team live if you're here. We got 181 of you beautiful people, and I know more are going to be rolling in. A couple of us probably hitting snooze after uh, a great weekend, right? The weather's cooling a little bit for many of us. Uh, you're able to actually go outside and not feel like you're walking through hot soup. If you live in the low country, you know what I'm talking about. So, uh, yeah, if you're hitting snooze right now, we'll see you guys. Come on back by the mid-roll. If you are on replay, hashtag team replay. I do love my team replay people. Uh, you know, I'm going to meet a lot of y'all. Team live and team replay at Wild West Hack and Fest. Can't wait for that. Ooh, I'm getting some news here. Just cleared my sec plus yesterday. She Sheba with the win. Nailing it. Hopefully you guys can hear the sound effects, please. Uh, give me a shout out. I saw Marcus Kyler say yeet. So I kind of take that as a confirmation that the... Uh, Sound is working. All right. Um, and finally, hey, if it's your first time here, welcome to the Buckies. Oh my God, James Edokudo. I am like permanently PTSD'd. Even seeing the words <laughs> cause me bananas. Um, listen, guys, um, if it's your first episode here, if it's your first show, we are on 473. But if it's your first time, give me a, a hashtag first timer in chat if you would. Do love. Um, do love welcoming the first timers enough that we did a sound a sound effect just for the first timers. Welcome the Buckies! Oh my God! All right, guys, we got 20 seconds. Just a a, a little note. Uh, I do have a pinned comment uh, on the right about Space Grand Challenge, which launches today. It's a CTF for like high schoolers, but it's open to anyone in the world. Uh, Cal Poly, I'm wearing their shirt right now. Uh, is putting it on. Great people over there. It's awesome. But for now, do me a favor, sit back, relax, and let's let the cool sounds of the hot news wash over us in an awesome wave. I will see you all at the mid-roll. From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. These are the cybersecurity headlines for Monday, October 16th. I'm Steve Prentice. Lockbit claimed attack on CDW. <clears throat> The tech giant CDW is investigating claims from Lockbit regarding leaks of data along with an $80 million ransom. CDW is describing the incident as, quote, an isolated IT security matter associated <coughs> with data on a few servers dedicated solely to the internal support of Sirius Federal, a small U.S. subsidiary of CDWG, end quote. The announcement describes the servers as, quote, non-customer facing and isolated from the CDW network and other CDWG systems, end quote. Wow. The FBI. And All right. So I knew CDW got hit. I did not realize CDW was that big. I guess I should have. Um, CDW is basically like a VAR, which, which the whole, just really quickly... <laughs> A VAR is a vendor ad reseller. If I'm not mistaken, that's what the acronym stands for. But basically some vendors uh, who make product, right? Like let's say Cisco. Cisco doesn't want to deal with their customers, okay? So what they do is they sell their product to, like you can only buy their product through a VAR, like CDW, right? So then the, the customer's experience and everything is through CDW. And then the vendor doesn't have to deal with it. And the vendor is business to business only. CDW is business to customer only. But the thing that's infuriating in, to me in most cases is a lot of times you're like, oh, I just want to buy this EDR solution, right? I just want to buy this endpoint detection response. I need 25,000 licenses. And they're like, yeah, sure. No problem. Uh, buy it through the VAR. And it's like, well, how much is it? It's like, it's $100 a license. All right. Well, that's going to be pretty expensive. But like, you know, I got, I need 2,500. That's, you know, $250,000 um, or 2.5 million, whatever. And then the VAR is like, yeah, sure. No problem. Here's an invoice for 3.2 million. And you're like, why, why, what, what, what value? Oh yeah. Value added reseller. That's what it is. I don't know if someone put it in chat value added reseller. What is the value? And, and by the way, thank you. Uh, an anonymous person on LinkedIn who said it, I, I forget what, or in Bruce edict says it too. value added reseller. Show me the value. Okay, like I'm, I know I'm crapping on uh, CDW here, and they just got punched in the mouth for uh, <laughs> ransomware. But, but I've never really 
appreciated the value that they're adding. You know, if you're like, if you're uh, a hot mess shop and you need like, you don't even know what you're trying to buy and you need like a bunch of tech, like you need MFA and EDR and professional services to implement it. Sure. Then, then, you know, you need basically like a professional shopper to go with you to point out all the things you need and then help you implement them correctly. That is fine. But when you're just trying to buy freaking licenses because you need to scale, oh, we, we acquired a new company. We need another 25,000 licenses. Sure, no problem. Go to the value add resellers. Like, I don't want, I don't want your value. Okay. All right. So, sorry. That's just, Fancy. that's just me coming off like from the left side, like coming, like coming, uh, like way, uh, cut from like, uh, like left stage, like behind the curtain and running onto stage and like just punching CDW in the, in the ear, right? <laughs> like a throat punch. They're like, Oh my God, we've been hit with ransomware. They want $80 million. What are we going to do? Jerry, can you help us? I'm like, sure. No problem. Value. Like just uh, mocking them. Okay. So here's the deal. Uh, CDW as a business made $22 billion in 2020, in the last 12 months, right? So um, if you if you look from June 22 to June 23, they made $22 billion. Now, if I'm not mistaken, what is 1% of 22 billion? Okay, this is how dumb I am. 1% um, of 22 billion, this can't be right. 220 million? Jesus. All right, so... Okay, so in the grand scheme of things, even though $80 million sounds absurd, typically ransom, just so you guys know, so you can do some quick math for your own business, ransomware payments typically are, uh, arrange around 3% to 7%, right? It's It's been trending down lately. So 3% is a pretty solid estimate of your annual revenue, right? So if you're trying to Honestly, if you're trying to piece together how much you should get for cybersecurity insurance, how much you should invest in cybersecurity around ransomware controls, how much, um, you know, like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, like how much you should be telling your, your uh, business the potential impact of a ransomware incident is. When you're factoring the ransomware payment amount, it should be roughly one and a half to three percent. It like I said, it's trending down, but three percent is pretty solid. This um this uh eighty million dollars, while it sounds outrageous, is uh one third of one percent. So right, so like what's point one percent of twenty two billion? Uh do 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 yeah, twenty two million. So they they actually asked for one third of a percent, roughly, right? Or one fourth, a, a quarter of a percent. I mean, yeah, a, a quarter of a percent. I mean, I'm not. I'm not being ridiculous here, but that's not an outrageous ransom demand. Okay, that's that's not outrageous. Now, whether or not a CDW pays, it doesn't matter. Uh, but I'm just telling you, like Lockbit, they're not shooting the moon here. Um, it says CDW offered one. Oh my God! So CDW offered Lockbit one million dollars in response to their $80 million. So Lockbit was, I mean, uh, CDW was gonna pay the ransom. They were just gonna pay $1 million. Now, I don't know if uh, Lockbit accepted this. Lockbit, you gotta remember, Lockbit is a ransomware as a service model. So this could have been some jabroni who doesn't even really understand what they're doing that hit CDW. It could also be a you know sophisticated threat actor. So it, it, it ranges. But if they were looking just to get paid, Great cash, homie. maybe they took the million dollars. I'm not sure, but, um, not a good look for CDW. Everyone gets hit with ransomware nowadays. So this is probably not going to affect CDW's stock or anything like that. Um, they are a publicly traded company. Let's just take a look here over the last month. Yeah, look at over the last month. When did they get hit? Um, this is, uh, when did they get hit? Computer. When did they get hit? Um, October 12th. Right, so four days ago, you could see this is a five-day uh, tre trending chart. You could see right here is probably where the news broke. But dude, they went from twenty uh, two hundred and fourteen dollars a share to two hundred and six. Right, so they're down two. Uh, they're down one percent. Again, in in the modern day, it used to be like you got a data breach, you were screwed at least for three to six months with your stock value. Nowadays, it's like it's like hitting. 
um, you know, uh, like a manhole cover on, on, on the road. Like you feel it, but you just keep on going. You don't even, you don't even look in your rear view mirror because it doesn't even matter. Right. That's what's going on nowadays. So anyways, that's a little bit of, um, a little bit of uh, background on calculating ransomware uh, payments typically in this particular instance. It's a big deal, but you know, whatever. CISA published joint advisory regarding Avis Locker ransomware. Okay, Jen. Updating a similar advisory published in March 2022, the announcement provides, quote, known IOCs, TTPs, and detection methods associated with the Avis Locker ransomware variants employed in recent attacks, end quote. Avis Locker is a ransomware as a service operation which has expanded out to include Linux systems, specifically VMware ESXi servers, using, quote, legitimate software and open source remote system administration tools to compromise the victims' networks, end quote. The EP. All right. So Avos Locker. Um, so CISA, Jen Easterly, Rockstar, director of CISA. Uh, and the FBI, you know, whatever. CIS's whole uh, jam is that they are, um, they're a lot like Simply Cyber, if I, <laughs> if I may uh, make an association. CIS is very supportive. CIS is very inclusive. CIS is all about um, um, collaboration, engagement. They really are the federal government version of Simply Cyber. <laughs> That is not spicy. That is just uh, silly. But okay, so um, they released IOCs for Avos Locker. Guys, here's the deal. Um, I appreciate that they did this, but you should not be, um, you should not, like, obviously, if your information security program is strong enough that you have all the foundational stuff and maybe, like, say on a, like, a maturity level of one to five, if you're like a two and a half or a three, yeah, then you could start doing threat hunting for IOCs and putting in controls to directly address specific ransomware threat actors. But if your program is zero, one, two, on a scale of one to five, as far as maturity goes, so like if you're ad hoc, if you're just kind of like sticking your thumb in like whatever hole is got the most water jutting out of it, you really just need to put in basic controls that help with ransomware, regardless of who the threat actor is. But in this case, if it's Avo Slocker, um, CISA and um, the FBI has released this information to help you um, identify if you're getting hosed and then uh, help slow it down. Apparently, Avos Locker's big thing is that they attack ESXi servers. So if you're hosting, first of all, if you don't know what ESXi is, then you're probably fine, right? Um, and if you do know what it is, then you, you, you definitely know what it is, right? So for those who don't know, ESXi is a virtual... Um, uh, like hypervisor, right? So if you run virtual machines in your environment, think of virtual machines as like, um, like uh, not blades, but what, what's a good way to think of a virtual machine? They, so think of a, a, a server rack, right? Like in a classic data center, you got the server rack and all the, all the servers are in there, the blades, right? A hypervisor is the server rack and the blades and servers in it are the virtual machines, right? So even though you got all these virtualized machines that you can reboot really quickly, image really quickly, scale up, scale down resources, you still need some container around it in order to control like networking, resource allocation. Because at the end of the day, at some point when you go down far enough down the rabbit hole, you will hit hardware, right? A virtual machine still runs on hardware somewhere. It's not like it's vaporware. So a virtual machine runs in a hypervisor. The hypervisor runs on hardware. ESXi is the hypervisor chassis, basically, that all these machines sit in. So obviously, if you can get, if a threat actor can get into the hypervisor, all your virtual machines are screwed, right? So that's what's going on with this. Obviously, that's a, a nightmare scenario for any business because basically all your machines go down. And threat actors love that because they hit one valuable resource and they hose everything. Uh, they talk in here about things you should look out for that Avos Locker uses. They use remote system administration tools. None of these are threat actor developed. These are all like ones that are used by businesses to actually do remote IT management. So they're not going to show up. They're not going to get flagged by EDR as bad, right? AnyDesk is a popular one. We saw that on ScamBaiter 100 versus uh, 100 uh, uh, scammers versus the people uh, video. Very good to watch. Uh, native Windows PS Exec. Again, that is not going to get triggered as a malicious binary. Um, 
because this is living off the land, right? Uh, I think PS exec, you have to install sys internals, but it doesn't matter. My point is administrators use this crap all the time, right? So oh, cobalt strike and sliver. Now that right there, if you find cobalt strike and sliver in your environment, you're screwed. That means they're in, they've got you and you better, um, you better <laughs> launch incident response at that point. These are post exploitation frameworks. Uh, cobalt strike is a, you know, a licensed one, but threat actors get licenses all the time. And then sliver is a open source one from Bishop Fox. All right, here's the deal. The TLDR here, CISA is awesome. He rescinds cyber regulations for water sector. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has sent a letter to state drinking water authorities that it will be withdrawing its requirements to conduct cybersecurity audits of water utilities that had been announced in a memorandum issued in March. According to CyberScoop, the EPA stated on Thursday that, quote, litigation from Republican states and trade associations raised questions about the long-term legal viability of the initiative to regulate the cybersecurity of water utilities, end quote. Despite this withdrawal, the EPA emphasized its commitment to encouraging cybersecurity in the water system and organizations such as the American Water Works Association and the National Rural Water Association, which were involved in the lawsuit, have, quote, renewed their call for a collaborative approach to cybersecurity measures in the water sector, end quote. All right. So I do know uh, as as. Niche as it is, we do have multiple members of the Simply Cyber community who do work in um, water sector, right? Water is one of the 18 or 19 critical infrastructures. You, you have to, someone will have to fact, fact check me on this one. Um, um, hold on, I guess PS exec um, have alerts users won't be installing that. All right, all right, so um. Fact check me on this one. I th I want to say there's 19 critical infrastructure sectors like financial, energy, health, water, dams, surprisingly, telecommunications, agriculture. Uh, I'm not I don't know all of them off the top of my head. Uh, but anyways, um, this one. Remember, guys, in a bigger macro picture, EPA, uh, excuse me, um, the U.S. federal government and CISA. To mention Jen again. Hey, Jen. Are on an effort to harmonize, harmonize, right? All federal cybersecurity regulations. So right now, and this is pretty common um, as you mature things, right now, each critical infrastructure kind of has their own rules, their own security, their own requirements, their own regulations. Some have like very little, some have a lot. And it's a lot of energy and effort to co collaborate, coordinate, develop tools that can be shared, et cetera. Um, so the US federal government is now on an effort to basically, we've been we've been diverging for a long time. Now they're looking to converge. They call it harmonizing, but they're essentially trying to converge a lot of these um, regulations. And this is the first one that I have seen where the industry, I guess for lack of a better term, is pushing back. And the EPA is the one I guess that has the authority in the water sector to say, nah, we're good. Now, I don't want to get political. They did mention that um, like a Republican contingent pushed back on this one. Um, I, I, I guess, I, I don't know, man. Like, here's my thing. Long-term legal viability of the initiative to regulate cyber and water utilities. I'd love people's thoughts on this. Like, what the heck is, um, like, who's... it? <sighs> I, so I get the private. I get that there's private sector who probably uh, runs a lot of the water utilities, right? Or like, kind of public private sector relationships. And by introducing new cybersecurity regulations, it's going to cost money. Uh, and money is something that maybe they don't have a lot of. So they were feeling the pressure, feeling the they were getting a little sweaty, uh, thinking about how they were going to implement these things. And then um, their lawmakers came in and hooked them up through. Uh, in trade associations, right? So basically lobbyists came in and and killed it for the water sector. I just, after, do you guys remember, this was not really a major cybersecurity issue as much as it was just poor cyber hygiene. But a couple years ago, somebody quote unquote hacked into Jacksonville, Florida's wastewater treatment plant and had the ability to add a bunch of 
like uh, dangerous levels of chemicals to the drinking water and effectively could have poisoned an entire community. That is pretty serious. Now, unfor like fortunately, that did not happen. Obviously, the engineer was there watching the mouse move around on the desktop. It's likely some goober uh, was trolling around and fell into the um, remote desktop session in Jacksonville, Florida. So it wasn't really like a nation state threat actor, but it called attention to the fact that, you know, you could poison a whole community, right? So I just, I don't get what the, um, what the argument was for not, not having cybersecurity in the water sector. Now, again, I didn't read this. Uh, I, f I usually mention this at the beginning and I forgot. I don't research these stories or do any prep. I just hit, I turn the cameras on and let's go. So uh, there could be some more here. I'd love to understand the argument that the Republican states and trade associations were making in the litigation around rejecting the idea of cybersecurity in the water sector. It seems um, it was, it was, it was, it was stupid. Honestly, I, I just don't understand. Like we're, we're hurting so bad at, you know, uh, like cyber is becoming more and more. We're seeing, we're seeing global conflicts now in multiple places surge up and the internet, there's only one internet guys, right? So if your water plant is on the internet and you have crappy cybersecurity, you're screwed. Like think about how long you can go. How long can you go without water, right? <laughs> Not long, right? So if you poison a lot of the water in a community, how long is that community going to be kind of like functional before you either like abandon it? There's a run on water, a breakdown in like kind of civil society. And I'm trying not to be hyperbolic here, but like water is freaking important, right? We saw with the pandemic, like toilet paper, like I bought black market toilet paper during the pandemic. Okay. Like I met someone in a parking lot and bought toilet paper out of the back of their car. All right. So and that was toilet paper. We had options. So you, like, don't, don't, don't mess with water. Don't mess with water. Okay. Quick trip. Disruptions. The convenience store chain that operates in Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, as well as under the name Quick Star in Illinois, Iowa, and South Dakota, says it is dealing with a, quote, network incident, quote, that has left employees... <laughs> it's quote, a ransomware incident. New orders, Come on. ...payments using the Quick Reward System and access the company's support systems, end quote, as well as adversely impacting corporate offices' email and phone systems. Although corporate communications from Quick Trip are currently avoiding clarification of the incident, experts at Bleeping Computer see the timeline and type of IT outages as a likely ransomware attack. Come on. It, it, it's obviously a ransomware attack. Like, like you've already called it uh, an incident, right? So you've already like broke the glass on that. And I, I say this from time to time, but if you're like new to in industry or whatever, you don't say the word incident until you absolutely have to, because when you say incident, now you activate, you know, incident response, you get the lawyers involved, insurance comes online, you start like, you know, communicating out. So um, people will call it an event up until they can. But once they say incident, like, dude, you have a ransomware note on your desktop, like it's a ransomware incident. Stop being so coy. No one cares. Um, all right. So people's quick trip rewards aren't working their credit cards aren't working um i wonder if uh they can actually like take credit cards and stuff because this actually gets interesting um hold on i'm kind of curious here Quick Trip employees have reported being unable to receive new orders, accept payments using the Quick Reward system, and access company support. Okay, so this is this is interesting. Okay, couple of things. One, uh, this is a huge gas station convenience store chain, eight hundred locations. Right, that's not nothing. That's that's a lot. Uh, I also want to say shout out to South Dakota, go Trojans, uh, Dakota State University. Whoop whoop. Um, company employs thirty five thousand people. Uh, it looks like they're still able to pump gas. They're still able to do stuff. It's just anything with the back end quick star, quick stop system or quick trip system is messed up. Um, the interesting thing I wanted to point out here is that um, with payment card industry data security standards or PCI DSS, 
I'm not a PCI expert, okay? So don't don't flame me if I if I get this somewhat wrong. But the PCI network has to be separate. Uh, I'm I'm oversimplifying this, but the PCI network has to be separate from your IT operations and everything like that. Like there needs to be clear segmentation. Um, and it looks like we're seeing it here because they're still able to take credit cards. They just can't use any of like the reward system or any of the quick trip related technologies underneath. So they're still able to, you know, buy and sell stuff, which is cool for the business, right? They're not that screwed, but, um, depending on how bad this is, obviously the story doesn't go into detail in any way, but if it was the Avos locker, right. And it gets into the ESXi chassis and screws up all their virtual machines that could be, you know, m m devastating, uh, for them to re uh, recover from. Uh, and if it's just like certain systems, then whatever, you know, hopefully they have backups and stuff like that. I just want to point out guys, this is a great example. Even if quick trip has backups and stuff, just because you have backups doesn't mean you're instantly back up. This isn't like restoring some files from a thumb drive, right? These are entire systems. Um, you know, we're talking transactional systems, right? So like, let's just say I have 35,000 points on my quick, quick trip card and I bought gas yesterday and I used 10,000 points, right? Well, if the backups are from a week ago, guess what's about to happen? I'm about to get 35,000 points again, or even worse. Like, let's say I made a huge purchase and I got 50,000 points and you recover from backups and now I have zero. I'm going to obviously be wicked pissed, right? So that's just like one tiny wrinkle to give consideration to when you're talking about transactional systems and restoring them. Plus, who knows how to restore the systems? Oh, Kevin does. Well, Kevin's on vacation. Well, Kevin better get back from vacation. Well, why didn't we train BSEC to do it? Oh, BSEC's a junior analyst and Kevin's always like, move. And BSEC's like, okay, I'll just move, even though I, I should probably learn this, right? So there's a million things that are working against businesses when they just restore from backups, right? Like what order do you restore the backups? Do you have the hardware to restore the backups? Like, have we tested these things, right? Okay. And now a word from our sponsor, Vanta. Growing a business? <clears throat> that likely means more tools, third-party vendors, and data sharing, aka way more risk. Vanta's market-leading trust management platform brings GRC and security efforts together. Integrate information from multiple systems and reduce risks to your business and your brand, all without the need for additional staffing. And by automating up to 90% of the work for SOC 2, ISO 27001, and more, you'll be able to focus on strategy and security, not maintaining compliance. Join 5,000 fast-growing companies that leverage Vanta to manage risk and prove security in real time. Our listeners get $1,000 off Vanta. So go to vanta.com slash CISO to claim this discount. That's V as in Victor, A-N-T-A dot com slash CISO. Mm -hmm. All right, let's do this. If you're a first timer here, I didn't see too many first timers. I saw Haircut Fish claim to be a first timer, but he's lying. Lies. All right, guys, I want to thank all of you, all of you, Stephen Mount, Marcus Kyler, Divine Dream Divine, Micah Romine, and Zach Choate. I want to thank all of you for being here. You guys are awesome. Thanks, Barricade Cyber Solutions and Panopsi Security for your continued support. I want to say really quickly, shout out to Anti-Siphon Training. If you know about Wild West Hacking Fest, then you know about Anti-Siphon Training. Anti-Siphon Training is disrupting the traditional cybersecurity training industry by providing high-quality, cutting-edge education to everyone, regardless of their financial position. They offer their students hands-on training with industry professionals who know exactly what they're doing. You, hey, Pappy C17, love it. Thanks, Pappy C. Hey guys, um, Zach Cho, you do have the baton. Go to the link in the description below. Go to training. Go to pay what you can training. And look at all this training. There's a calendar right here. Get in line. Giddy up on it. Look at all this. Professional mentorship, packet decoding, API testing. You can't stop me. Look at this. John Cena action right here. You can't see me. Look at all this action. Get in here. George Strasberger. Love it, love it, love it. Guys, use the link in the description below. Don't sleep on this training. It's amazing, and I love anti-siphon training.
All right, guys. Do me a favor, hit the like button really quickly. It Basically, it pays it forward and it helps other people find the channel. Like Edward Ungrand, first timer. Yes. All right, guys. Hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Guys, if you want to supercharge your LinkedIn feed, simple. If you want to supercharge your LinkedIn feed, if you want to grow your LinkedIn network with cybersecurity professionals who are awesome, do the following. Go on LinkedIn. Look for this hashtag. Hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Connect to the people who are posting and comment on their posts. Connect to the people in the comments. Now that you're a commenter, people will connect with you because you're in the comments, right? You see how it works? It's like it's like um, recursion if you're a software developer. We're getting recursive up in here, all right? Zach Cho currently has the baton. Zach Cho is going to tag somebody. Whoever gets the baton, please accept the baton. Go on LinkedIn and share your cybersecurity story. We want to know who you are and what your story is. And then everybody else. Go connect with that person and comment on their post. Connect to the people in the comments. Believe me, five, like 10 minutes a day, two weeks, your network on LinkedIn will become way more valuable and your feed on LinkedIn will become way more valuable. No one else is really doing this that I know of. It's a way to crowdsource and leverage LinkedIn to supercharge your own feed. It's dynamite. Thank you, Micah Romine. Micah knows what's up. All right, guys, I want to say a really sh quick shout out. Uh, this is an unusual one, but dude, Cal Polytech right now is running the Space Grand Challenge. This is October 16th through 21st. You can register right now. It opens at 9 a.m. Pacific time. So in about three and a half hours from now, it is a CTF challenge. It runs five days. It is designed for high schoolers, but it is open to everybody in the world. Now, don't don't be like, oh, no. Like, I'm 35. I can't do a high school challenge. Blah. Well, here's my thing. One, if you are into cybersecurity, it would probably be a lot of fun. Two, if you're looking to break into the industry, wouldn't you prefer challenges that are more geared towards um, a little bit uh, less challenging so you can understand some of the more core fundamentals? Plus, these aren't like baby challenges. These are legit full, fleshed out really cool ctfs and it's absolutely free go into the pinned comment or i'll drop a link in chat right now go check it out and if someone asks you tell them simply cyber sent you yeah are you smarter than a high schooler there you go look it's simple as here here's the application to register right here on the website i'm clicking i'm clicking i'm clicking still clicking there we go do 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 and while this is coming up i just want to show you guys um it's cool. Like basically the reason I'm even mentioning this and promoting this is because I had a call with the people over at Cal Polytech um, about an event they're doing next year. And I love what they're doing. They are so cool. They are so nice. They do a lot of really great things. And they're like, oh, we're doing the Space Grand Challenge. I'm like, yeah, heck yeah. Let me tell Simply Cyber people about it. All right. K. Scott Powell with a panel interview coming up. Way to go, K. Scott Powell. Crush it, buddy. All right, and to those first timers that were up in here, welcome to the party, pal. Welcome to the party, pal. Uh, also, just quick programming note: typically Mondays are Callan's Art of the Week. Um, I don't know if Callan's like phasing out of Art of the Week. He still does a lot of creative stuff, but um, he's not really punching in and doing simply cyber work. And since um, since I don't employ him technically uh, to do the Callan's Art of the Week, I can't. I can't really hold his feet to the fire on that one. So uh, just shout out to Callan for the art he's done over the years um, and taking a sabbatical. Uh, all right. So let's keep going. Microsoft phases out NTLM. The Windows NT LAN Manager NTLM will be eliminated from Windows 11 in the near future in favor of bolstering its primary mechanism, Kerberos Authentication Protocol, which has been the default method for over two decades. It's pronounced Kerberos. NTLM was introduced in the 1990s, and Microsoft says it will focus instead on new features for Windows 11, such as initial and pass-through authentication using Kerberos, IA Kerb, and a local key distribution center, KDC, for Kerberos. It's pronounced Kerberos, um, so don't don't say Kerberos or whatever he was saying in a um, in an interview. All right, um, 
So NTLM has been around for like a million years. Um, it's 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 a favorite of uh, pen testers, threat actors. Um, and I, I believe it's at the root of pass the hash. It's definitely, um, not definitely, it could be involved with Kerber roasting. Um, so anyways, the fact that Microsoft's phase in and out is totally on brand. The only thing that I would say is it could be difficult to phase it out. A lot of people do like legacy systems and legacy environments. There's a lot of people still running Microsoft Server 2008 R2 in their environments, which like if you didn't catch it on stream, you can rewind it and why I roll. Um, when you upgrade, dude, when you upgrade your laptop from like Windows 7 to Windows 11, you just hit a button and leave and come back and you got Windows 11, right? When you upgrade Windows environments, like domain controllers, not only do you upgrade the operating system, but there's a thing called schema uh, that's kind of like the back end structure of a domain controller and Active Directory and your environment, that that also gets upgraded and it can break a lot of stuff, right? So I'm not crapping on sysadmins um, who haven't upgraded off of 2008 R2, but um, I am saying that if you're still running 2008 R2 in your environment, you probably need to prioritize migrating off of it, right? And and by the way, between you and I, you don't, you definitely know you should have been doing it the last couple of years, right? Like, let's be real, you know, uh, but it's easy to kick it down the curb, uh, kick it down the street. Okay. So Microsoft's going to phase it out. Obviously this is going to make environments more secure if they fully adopt it. Um, but if they support for legacy NTLM, obviously it's going to be a hot mess on fire. What's up, Matt? First timer. Welcome to the party, pal. Yep. Oh my God. If you're still rolling NT 4.0, um, first of all, you definitely got gray in your hair. Second of all, um, yikes. Um, <laughs> so anyways, yeah. And really quickly, I, people mentioned it in chat. I was definitely going to say it. Uh, Kerber roasting is, uh, was invented by Tim Medine um, or discovered by Tim Medine or whatever you want to say. However, uh, Tim Medine, uh, he runs Red Siege, which is a really cool uh, offensive security, uh, cybersecurity company. I like how, here he is right here. He's a really nice guy. Uh, Tim Medine, this guy right here. In fact, Jess Bishop, I, I think, was like hanging out with him uh, last weekend at B sides Jacksonville or B sides Nashville, one of the B sides. Anyways, if you're going to Wild West Hackenfest, Tim might be there. The final thing I'll say about that is um, Red Siege. This is like a complete sidebar. Red Siege every Wednesday actually hosts a open 30 minute meeting um, with offensive security people. If you're if you're even remotely interested in offensive security or you're a defender and you are um, looking to like be better at being a defender, or blue team or right, like not, not tier one, but like if you're a tier two, tier three, and you're like looking to increase your knowledge and do threat hunting and stuff like that, Wednesday offensive is definitely worth your time to go uh, check out. I dropped the link in chat. It's basically every single Wednesday. You can see here they're having a SANS author and instructor of SEC 760 Advanced Exploit Development as their guest uh, oh, last week. So they'll have a guest this week. Anyways, TLDR, NTLM, a lot of acronyms. NTLM is going away. This probably makes hackers' tears um, taste even sweeter. But let's be real. <laughs> a lot of environments are still going to be running NTLM for years uh, for backward compatibility and legacy support. UK finds Equifax for 2017 data breach. Britain's Financial Conduct Authority watchdog agency fined the UK arm of Equifax just over 11 million pounds, about $13.6 million for, quote, allowing hackers to access personal information of millions of people in 2017, <clears throat> end quote. This case is separate from litigation and settlements that Equifax agreed to in the US in 2019. Instead, it focused on the fact that Equifax Limited, the firm's UK business, exposed data because it outsourced processing to servers run by its US parent, Equifax Inc. Equifax Limited was not aware that UK consumer data had been accessed, quote, until six weeks after Equifax Inc. had discovered the hack, end quote. This case is also separate from one brought by Britain's Information Commissioner's Office in 2018 that fined Equifax Limited £500,000 for violating data protection rules related to that same 2017 incident. 
All yeah. right, hold on one second. Uh, let me just check Equifax. Right, it's great cash, homie. That's right, that's right, Randy. Equifax annual revenue five billion dollars. Five billion billion. Equifax hit for thirteen million dollars. Yawn. Okay. Also, this is it. Not this is um in addition to in addition to a six hundred thousand dollar fine they got. Ooh. Guys, like, again, I hate to crap on it because this is like real money to you and me. But when you're fining a company that makes $5 billion, $600,000, like, does management even find out about it? Or did they just like stroke a check from petty cash? Like, oh, hey, tip the, tip the Uber driver while you're out there, please. Like, so anyways, Equifax, it, it grosses me out, frankly. Um, in in our society, data is the new gold, right? And there are data brokers. I've, I've talked about data brokers on the show before. But like Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian are like the OG data brokers because you, you, you need, in, at least in our US society, you need credit to be able to like build wealth, to be able to buy property, be able to like get a loan, get a car, like do the things you need to do to enable yourself to grow and, and basically be able to provide for your family and then you know maybe in, start trying to build generational wealth right which is a bit of a a reach and stuff but like these three private industries control your credit uh so they have access to tons of data and it's just i don't know it just kind of grosses me out and they had a massive data breach when i say massive we all remember it. Equifax, major data breach. Everyone data got taken. You didn't have a choice. You can't opt in to be in an Equifax. You can't opt out. It's just there. Okay. So they have a UK or a European faction. Now this is just straight up um, business, right? If you think about it for a minute, okay? Think about this for a minute. Equifax with their, you know, sticky little fingers wants to make as much money as they can okay straight cash homie straight cash homie right so they're trying to make as much money as they can they're like oh hey we do this in the us let's do it in the uk no big deal all right well the uk falls under um gdpr at least i believe they do i you know they had the brexit thing so i don't know it's so strange with the european union and gdpr but like let's just say for the sake of this discussion there are different regulations that apply in the uk than in the united states more strict privacy guidelines. So you need to segment your business in order to comply with those regulations. But that costs money, Jerry. Why Why do we need to stand up a second business over here to do processing when we have a processor in Tacoma, Washington? That's perfect. Let's just send the data over there, process it, send it back. No big deal. Okay, cool. So they do that. And I guarantee... Okay, so now, now I'm... Okay. Here, here's what I'll say about this. I guarantee you Okay, I guarantee you money that matters to me that it cost Equifax less than, uh, excuse me, it would have cost Equifax more than $13.6 million to run the processing or whatever they had to do over in England, right? So here's what I'm saying from a straight up financial decision perspective, straight business decision, nothing to do with cybersecurity. Hey, we want to work in the UK. Okay, well, you can, but they have these regulations. Well, what's that mean? Well, you're going to have to stand up a second facility just for UK data. It's going to cost $50 million. Oh, that's a lot of money. How much can we make? Well, you can make a billion dollars. Oh, well, that's that's a pretty good return on investment. We invest 50. Well, wait a minute. Why would we invest 50? Don't we have that situation over in Tacoma, Washington? Yeah, but technically you need to comply with the law that says you can't do that. It has to be an independent data situation. You can't mix UK and, and American data. Well, what, what if we do? Well, it's a $13 million penalty. Oh, hmm. All right. So I can spend 50 million and introduce all sorts of like new HR issues and labor overhead and all that crap. Or I can spend less money, have less headache and still make the same amount of money and have higher higher profit margins. Hmm. Let's go. And by the way, by the way, that's if you get caught, right? If, if you get caught, Equifax got hacked and that's how this came out. They would have still been running roughshod with UK data over in the United States if they hadn't gotten breached in the first place, which is where it came out that that data was involved. 
And, and it took six months for them to even figure it out. Do you see what I'm saying? Not every business person is righteous. Not every business person is altruistic, right? It's all about great cash, homie. Microsoft's October Windows 10 security <laughs> updates failed to install. <laughs> In an announcement released Friday, the company said it had, quote, received reports of an issue where Windows updates released on October 10th of this year failed to install. Devices might initially display progress, but then fail to complete installation. The impacted systems are Windows 10 21H2 and Windows 10 22H2, and the error code appears as 0x800-7000D. Microsoft has provided a support page to help resolve the problem. And all right, so I mean, this is just a shout out. Um, I mean, this is kind of infosec -y related. Basically, if you're trying to do your vuln management patching, patch Tuesday, um, it could break. I'm sure Microsoft is, uh, there's already a workaround to get it fixed. Microsoft's probably fixing the patch right now to make it a little bit more robust. Send this to your help if you come across this. Um, if depending on what you do for your business, you might want to fire this over to um, help desk and you know IT. This is from October 13th. So depending on what your vulnerability management uh, plan looks like, how you roll out patches and stuff like that, you may already know about this. But um, this is just good for situational awareness, especially help desk, who's going to get the calls when when this thing. Um, actually, help desk might not even get a call honestly because. When this update error is encountered, the end user, Carl, Carl! your end user is going to still be able to access Windows. They're still going to just move forward. So, like, honestly, help desk probably won't get calls now that I think about it. Uh, but IT should be mindful of this and be able to help um, push this out. Again, you're going to run into a little bit of a challenge here because. End users are not going to want to do the workaround, especially if it's like somewhat technical. So you need visibility on this and you need to know how to. Oh, okay. So I guess, hey, I'm finding this this coming in right now uh, from BSEC, who's in the BSEC in the field. Help desk will be getting calls on this. His help desk was getting calls. So go ahead and share this with help desk and just know that, you know, basically there's a workaround. You got to get it fixed. Okay. Ooh, uh, super chat coming in. Super chat from James McQuiggan. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Missing something here today. Oh, yeah. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Playing chess, talking the Cyrus, educating the next gen. Jerry Osier is the man. Well, thank you, James McQuiggan. Preaching to the choir, team live, coffee cup cheers. Good on you, James. Just a reminder, James and I are co-presenting at Wild West Hack and Fest later this week. I believe Thursday morning at 10 a.m. local time, right after the keynote. So if you're in... It, if you're in Deadwood, you're absolutely going to see me and James. There's no question. You can't not. It's like such a small conference. But um, come to our talk. We've actually got some really fun slides and some engaging content. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, yeah, it'll be fun. Let's go. Well, last week in ransomware. Last week saw an attack on Canadian flagship airline Air Canada with Bian Lian claiming responsibility. ALF V announced it had attacked state courts across Northwest Florida, and Simpson Manufacturing had to shut down its IT systems but has not confirmed the cause as being a ransomware attack. We also heard from the threat actor known as Cappuccino, spelt with a K, releasing the source code for the first version <coughs> of Hello Kitty ransomware, claiming to be developing a new one that will rival Lockbit. Just a reminder that they will... Uh... Okay, uh, so uh, Zig, say say that question for um, Jawjacking. All right, guys. So it's Monday. There's always like a ransomware roundup. Um, oh no, Avatar over here. This is not a real threat actor. You got to have the anime, uh, the uh, the the female anime character. Um, I, I'm being facetious. Uh, this is obviously a threat actor. Um, with the Ransomware roundups. I say the same thing every week. All you got to do is go in here. There's ransomware every day. It's a hot mess on fire. Find one of these ransomware incidents that works for your industry or works for your, you know, geographical region or works for your, you know, business size, whatever. File it away and make some, um, 
you know, if you have to educate your business, your end users, make a budget request, do a awareness training. It is October. It is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Maybe find one in here that speaks to you. The Gookie ransomware, the Hello Kitty one, right? Cappuccino. Dude, you know, the 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 world's your oyster when it comes to educating threat um end users on ransomware, right? You can you can definitely find one that resonates. Uh, we got a little uh, C++ code here. No big deal. Definitely don't show this to your end users because their eyes will glaze over. Um, so anyways, yeah, that, that's all there is to it. Thre you know, ransomware bad, basically. <laughs> all right, let's do this. All right, guys. That is going to do it for today's episode. What are we at? 8.57, so nailing it on time. Uh, just a reminder, again, the pinned comment, if you showed up late on YouTube, there is a pinned comment for the Cal Polytech Space Grand Challenge. It is a free, open, capture the flag cybersecurity competition uh, designed for high schoolers. So you would, you would expect the challenges to be approachable. Uh, a lot of fun. You can access it from anywhere in the world if you have remote, you know, internet. Basically, if you're watching this, you have internet. Okay. So giddy up on this. I'll drop the link in chat one more time. Tell them Simply Cyber sent you, okay? I'm promoting this because I like Cal Polytech. I like the people who work there, and I like the work they're doing. This is this is not paid or anything like that. This is me being super pumped about it. And I'm wearing their cool shirt. Thank you, Cal Polytech. All right, guys. No Simply Cyber Live this weekend because I will be in Deadwood uh, at Wild West Hackenfest. All right, guys, if you were here just for the news, thank you all so very much. I genuinely appreciate it. It is Monday, so we're going to do some jaw jacking. So stay tuned. If you were here just for the news, thank you all. And we'll see you tomorrow at 8 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, hold on. I might have. Um, when was the last time I did World of Haiku? Oh, yeah. No World of Haiku today. All right. We'll see everybody. Oh, Zachary Caudle was tagged for the baton. Zachary Caudle. Zachary Cottle, are you in chat, mom? Are you in chat, bud? Let's see. All right, Zach. Here we go. Um, Zachary Cottle, uh, Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Holler at me. All right, guys. We are going to go. I am doing Wild West. So I am doing... Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Briefing live from Wild West Hack and Fest. Absolutely, James. Uh, and we could figure it out together. All right. Um, if you're here for jaw jacking, let me introduce you to what jaw jacking is because it's freaking awesome. Let's go. All right, everybody, welcome to the show. My name is Jerry Guy. This is the after hours from the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Briefing podcast called Jaw Jacking. It's much more chill, as you can see from the 80s retro vibes, the 80s retro synthwave music, and just the cool people in chat. All, all these people over here, awesome. All right, so um, James McQuiggan asked if we're doing Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Briefing live from Deadwood. Absolutely, we're going to be doing it. I don't know what it's going to look like right now, but we'll figure it out and have a good time. All right, so building a cyber range at a university, Zig is asking. So Zig, what I would suggest you do is get comfortable with Docker containers. With a Docker container, you can containerize a challenge very easily. Make sure that all the, you know, dependencies, libraries, everything about the challenge is self-contained and it makes it very easy to deploy, um, you know, in other people's environments using Docker. So that's what I would say with that, Docker containers. Um, then obviously, depending on what kind of challenge you want, right? Like there's like hidden flags, there is digital forensics, like carving something out. There's simple ones like putting it in source code. If you are um, need ideas, like do the Space Grand Challenge, do the Huntress CTF, right? But I personally, I think Docker containers is a good way to go. 
Sherry says, doctor, a question. Did you figure out the situation with the Brady Bunch camera? Happy face, just a little humor. Did you figure out the situation with the Brady Bunch camera? Um, are you, oh, maybe Sherry's talking about the, um, the, uh, simply CyberCon wet run we did on Friday. That was pretty good. Uh, we're going to do another wet run cause we had a lot of technical difficulties. Plus I really was hoping that the discord, uh, we could test the discord and the workflow of workflow of a user or a speaker coming in, going through the green room, moving into, you know, through the discord channels. Um, so we're going to do another wet run probably a week from friday so we'll see where that goes fallon watts simply cyber have you looked at the cyber patriot program what do you think of it education wise so i haven't looked at cyber patriot deep but i will tell you fallon that i have heard of cyber patriot over the years like three or four years now i have um i've heard about it i think this is designed for high schoolers it's kind of like um ccsd except at the high school level Everything I've heard about it, Fallon, is positive. I'm looking at it right now. U.S. Cyber Patriot is the link. Also, hey, uh, Kimberly, can you drop a link for um, U.S. Cyber Games in mod chat, please? All right, so registration is now open. Uh, this can't be right. It says register by July 1st. Yeah, so if you are a high school teacher, if you have a high school student uh, in your home, like your child or someone you care for, and you want to get them into, uh, see if they're into cybersecurity, Cyber Patriot is definitely a really cool uh, opportunity. There you go. Thanks, Fallon Watts, for sharing that. All right. R Ryan Gardner says, could you use Docker containers for malware analysis? Hmm. Could you use Docker containers for malware analysis? Um, yes. So here's what I'm thinking. You could containerize like Flare VM or containerize Remnux or something, right? So now you, you've got your own instance and then make part of your Docker file the malware sample to bring into it. Um. The whole thing with malware analysis is you want to protect yourself from infecting your host, right? Like, so at the end of the day, when you're thinking about doing analysis, your base, your basic goal is to prevent self-infection with the Docker container. Yeah. I suppose if you make sure that you disable networking, you could do it. It's not really much different than a VM, frankly. Um, I, I haven't done it that way myself, Ryan, but I think, I think it, would it, I mean, it certainly would be better than uh, cracking it on your own local desktop. So, yeah, we could probably. If someone in chat has other thoughts around um, using Docker container for mal analysis, let me know. Fallon Watts says, I've been a technical mentor for two years and would love to get more people helping mentor and help kids inspired. Oh, cool, Fallon Watts. So, hey, Fallon, maybe... Um, I'm super busy right now, but maybe for 2024, and I know this is like a long-term thing, but it would be cool, Fallon, if you came on to Simply Cyber Live, my Thursday long-form one-hour guest interview, for you to come on and talk about Cyber Patriot and, you know, like getting involved and what mentoring's done and how it's helped and if, if you're interested. So Leonardo is telling Ryan... Uh, you need for Docker malware analysis. You need to configure it extra. It's not recommended. Better to use an isolated VM. I agree, Leonardo. <clears throat> Shadow Crab, I am an apprentice. This next module of my training is math and algorithms. Any advice you would give someone to their brain doesn't melt? <laughs> um, well, I, not really. I mean, Shuttle Crab, usually math and algorithms is part of a computer science degree curriculum. Algorithms are fine. Um, there's two things about algorithms. One, you know, like finite state machines um, and, and like, you know, moving through them. That's pretty easy. I, I always did not enjoy when you start talking about um, the performance of code, right? So like when you talk about big O notation, I, I'm getting kind of deep into computer science right now, but when you're talking about big O notation and how fast a search uh, query runs, right? And, and 
honestly, in today's day and age, like, yeah, you should write optimized code, but like systems are so fast now that like you can have a crappy bubble sort and it'll still happen pretty quickly. Uh, but that's where algorithms come into play. And, you know, but as far, I mean, unfortunately, Shuttle Crab, it, it's really, there's no shortcut. You got to lean into it and just go for it. Zig says, is it possible to build a real life scenario network with Docker? <laughs> now with Docker, I think you need to do like, uh, so I think the answer is yes. I don't know how Docker works with networking. I've only done Docker as isolated single instances. I haven't done multiple Docker containers and configured the networking underneath it. So, and I don't know if that's where Kubernetes comes in. I'm not a Docker expert, Zig, unfortunately. I do believe you can have multiple containers that uh, that do talk to each other. But um, yeah, I, I'm definitely not an expert on that. All right, looks like Zachary Cottle has um, not responded. So we're gonna go ahead and I'm going to tag somebody for the Simply Cyber Community Challenge. If you're feeling froggy and you wanna jump, let me know in chat and I'd love to tag you for, it goes to the first one available. All right, Tony Parrish wants to know what I think about Hack the Box. Huge fan, love Hack the Box, love what they're doing. Um, I do think that Hack the Box used to be a little, um, I don't want to say elitist, but like you used to have to like do a challenge to even like register an account. They've gotten rid of that. They've gotten more inclusive. They have, they just released a, um, like a sock analyst path. They have hints now. I, I think hack the box is excellent. I do want to point out though, that while you can become quite skilled with hack the box, um, it, it is, um, it's hands-on practical skills, which is hugely valuable, but you should be complementing it with quote unquote theory, right? So like fundamentals of information security, like what, what's the industry look like? What are all the different kind of core concepts? What is risk? How do you calculate risk? You're not going to do a hack the box lab. That's going to help you understand like what governance is or what an information security office, you know, structure looks like or how vulnerability management relates to, GRC, right? So uh, it's good, but I would definitely um, pair it with something else. David Robbins. David Robbins for the win. Go on, David. You got it. David Robinson's got the baton. Oh, my God. All right. Definitely appreciate it. I appreciate everybody who uh, said they were interested in taking the baton. Uh, David Robbins is the first one that jumped into chat uh, that I saw. So definitely appreciate it. Leonardo Nunez in chat right now. He is an OSCP holder and he is recommending the CPTS from Hack the Box Academy as the best path to, be, best path to become a competent pen tester. Very nice. Oh, there we go. Trisha, Trisha Kortikos. Trisha Kortikos, a squad member, is asking right now in chat if anyone wants to giddy up and team up for Space Grand Challenge. Just a reminder, everybody, the Space Grand Challenge is absolutely free. It opens at 9 a.m. Pacific time today, so in three hours. So if you got some time off, if you got a little bit of a downtime, you want to have some fun, guys, this is an opportunity, A, to network. By the way, shout out to Trisha asking like guys networking doesn't have to be writing like a 500 word blog post and then spamming the internet with it networking trish is doing it right now hey does anyone want to form a team for the ctf believe this if you say yes if you do the ctf with trisha you're going to get to know trisha you're going to learn you're going to talk ctfs yeah you'll be cranking on but you're also going to be hey you know like what are you into like you know how long you've been here or whatever right you're going to build relationships thanks trisha the Space Grand Challenge is also in uh, a pinned comment right now if you're interested in learning more. All right. I got to skip this song. That song, like that that saxophone, guys, like I get pregnant listening to that song. Wow. All right. 
All right, Francis Stockhill signed up for the ISC 2CC exam today. Crush it. I And then right on the heels of that, I.O. Io Deesh Johnson, squad member, crushing it past the CC this weekend. Congratulations. Very nice. All right. Hey, Trisha, looks like Cyber Newbie wants to team up. Pretty cool. Oh, my God. My stomach's a little upset, guys. I don't know if anyone else is doing dealing with this. I'm not, like, sick, but, like, I don't know. Just kind of, like, a little nauseous. Oh, hey, can I share a uh, – see, guys, some of the best things from jawjacking come, like, 10 minutes into jawjacking. I have a massive update. Massive update. Catch me outside. I got a massive update on the buffer osier flow presented by Red Bull and Palmetto Exterminators um, studio. Okay. The studio, Mrs. Osier, is officially completed with construction, painting, trimming, window treatments. The TV has been hung. We went to Costco and bought a 10 foot by 9 foot rug, laid that baby out. We're moving in. Here's the thing I can't move in little by little because like the whole studio needs to go like it needs to be like one massive migration right because if you think about it like i operate simply cyber i can't i i can't just like you know move my desk in and then be working from a laptop for a week so we got done yesterday about 6 p.m and you know i had i had recorded the patriots game i wanted to watch the patriots game please i thank you in advance for your condolences so I, we were done and uh, I've got, you know, work, work, and then wild west hacking fest. So I didn't, we don't have time to, to move in, but I think next weekend I'm going to move in guys. It looks amazing. It's so cool. Um, it's a little echoey in there right now. And I want to get those sound dampening boards, but uh, the, the, the space is kind of tricky as far as like where you can hang those boards, but uh, I'm super pumped guys, super freaking pumped. What's up, Base Case? Good to see you. Base Case saying that there's some interesting questions in here. Let's take a look. No, no, Lyle Murden. I, I'm joking. Like, Palmetto Exterminators is just a local company in my area. And I'm joking, like, that they, you know how, like, they sponsor, like, local hockey teams and stuff? I was just being funny. They're also not officially sponsoring <laughs> anything. But if you are a business in chat right now and you're looking to get naming rights to the studio that is available you can have naming rights to my studio that would be insane right like presented by red bull uh, dude i'll put a i'll put a graf like a uh, mural on the side of my studio if you sponsor it um all right so let's see what um what questions are in chat that um base case is asking about yes tom bishop Italy. Good to see you, buddy. All right. What are we doing here? Um, oh, thanks, Darius Cater. I've been doing a lot of ginger. I like ginger. Frank, have you ever thought about attending B-Sides Atlanta? We are looking for sponsors next year. Um, no, I hadn't considered. I've been to B-Sides Augusta, which is really cool. I haven't been really looking at 2024. I am so hyper-focused on trying to get the work done that I've agreed to work on that I haven't. The only reason I went to um, B-Sides Charleston is because they asked me to keynote it, which is like an amazing honor. So I absolutely said yes to that. Uh, Teddy Wang. Oh yeah. No sh <laughs> Teddy. It's killing me, man. It's killing me. Brutal. Uh, so Sherry, when you go to the store to buy eggs in an 18 pack that is made out of cardboard, take the eggs out and the cardboard will your sound dampening cheap but effective oh that's a good call thank you uh tom uh, Jess bishop jeff 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 i know you know what it's so funny jess i never once noticed that you and tom have the same last name jess bishop and tom bishop coincidence i don't think so besides atlanta was good that's cool i'll definitely um add it to the, when is besides atlanta I definitely spelled it wrong. October. Oh, it just happened. Of course. Yeah, I could probably go to this next year. 
I'm going to try to go to one conference a quarter. Very cool. Atlanta's not that far. I can drive to Atlanta. Surprisingly, Atlanta is north of Charleston. Like, fun fact. It's kind of crazy. Oh, I'm looking at this, by the way. <laughs> Besides Atlanta. All right. I love jaw jacking too, Kenneth. So Kuda Chimera says, any career advice for a person who wants to specialize in cybersecurity niche for critical infrastructure security? Yeah, so uh, Kuda Chimera, if you want to specialize in critical infrastructure, I mean, obviously get the basics, right? Um, so here, I'm going to put exclamation point book. There's a this link to this book, Kuda Chimera. It's absolutely free. You can download it. I wrote it. Um, it'll give you 10 steps in order. Um, I think step four or five is where you like niche down. That's where you would choose critical infrastructure. My suggestion to you, Kuda, is which region of critical infrastructure? There are 19 sectors, right? Once you figure out which one you want, then start going, learning about that specific area, specific plans, go to conferences in that niche or sector, meet people, tell them that you're learning and then get in uh, to the, just get in, you'd be crushing it. All right. Let me check my calendar really quickly, y'all. Jerry, Kim. Oh, I have a touch point with Kim. <laughs> um, let me see this. Um, so I wanted to share something else with you guys. Um, check this out. If you're interested in a cool thing, uh, U.S. Cyber Games Draft 2023. So today is October 16th. It's the official draft day of the U.S. Cyber Team. You can see right here, October 16th. If you're interested in checking it out, uh, it's very cool. Nick Barker, love it, love it, love it. All right, so U.S. Cyber Games, check it out. This is the drafting of the United States team. Uh, I'm hoping to see a lot of Dakota State University representation. Just saying, I got my PhD and one of my masters from Dakota State University, and they represent strong on the U.S. cyber team. Uh, so definitely um, want to shout this out and share it with everybody. I'm sure you'll see some stuff on social media around it. Looks like... Um, Yes. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Yeah, it's absolutely free to register and check it out. Don't, don't be shy. Um, uh, Zuri's uh, trying to go to Atlanta and Augusta B-sides. Definitely cool. Yes. So Francis Stocktill is saying a lot of entry-level roles ask for a bachelor's degree and three years of experience. This is true. Um, guys, cybersecurity jobs are highly competitive and, you know, the prereqs are not fair. What I'm telling you is networking, 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 networking. It's the most valuable thing you can do. Practical skills are in demand. Networking is as important, if not more important. Okay, dude. Check this out. Look at this. Wild West Hacking Fest. This is what's happening later this week. Oh, my stomach, bro. Um, here's the conference agenda. Here's the keynote with Leslie. Hacks for pancakes. And then look at this guy. Look at this right here. Is this, is it, who is this? James and Jerry. Wait, wait, what's James and Jerry talking about? How important it is to network and how to do it. If you're a junior person, if you're a senior person, we are gonna go through it and explain to you exactly how to do it. This is how valuable and how important networking is that James and I are literally giving a talk on it because it's that freaking important, okay? I'm not, here's the deal, guys, okay? I'm gonna tell you something 
straight up. You could be the valedictorian of your high school. You could be the graduating top number one person, the smartest person in the room. You spent every available extra second in the lab. You haven't seen the light of day in four years. You're the best. You're the absolute best, right? You don't get the job. Why? Because hiring managers aren't looking. Uh, yeah, they want the best. They want talent. But guess what? The hiring manager doesn't know about you and how awesome you are. Do you know why? Because you haven't networked. It's basic, right? I'm sorry. But the reality is people are humans. Human nature is trust in relationships. If I have a job, I have a need, right? And I, I have someone standing right next to me that I know can do it. Or I have this pool of of, of the ether where I'm sure there's smarter people, no disrespect to this fictitious person standing here, smarter people out there who could do it faster, cheaper, better. But guess what? I'd have to go find them. I'd have to go evaluate. I'd have to go assess. I'd have to interview. I'd have to do all these things. Why would I do that when I have you standing right here and I know you can do it, right? Boom. Networking, networking, networking. It's so valuable. It's ridiculous. Nick is at the airport. Yes, Nick. All right. We got a couple more minutes and then I got a meeting with the lovely Kimberly can fix it. Nick Barker's at bag drop off. Nice. Guys, if you are going to Wild West Hack and Fest, let me just tell you, because I went last year, Wild West Hack and Fest, they have at least last year they did. I'd be stunned if they didn't do it this year. Deb and Jason are at the airport. They set up like an entire little like welcome situation. Um, it's very, like, dude, the first thing you do is like hug somebody when you get in there. High fives everywhere. The bus is cool. Uh, when you get on the bus, you're definitely um, talking to people, networking. It's like lobby con on wheels. And um, yeah, it's just a great time. And by the way, if you're flying into Rapid City, chances are a lot of people on the plane are going to the conference, right? Like, it's not a coincidence. I, I, I'm Like, I met Kimberly and her brother. Um, I don't even remember where we flew into Kimberly, but like Dallas or Charlotte or wherever. And, uh, and we were on the same flight, right? So that's what's up. What's the website for Simply CyberCon? Breck Means is asking. I got you, Breck sccon. Uh, simply cybercon.org all right da it was Dallas thank you Kimberly uh Trisha I just tried to connect with you on LinkedIn very cool all right Nick Barker you're gonna love it oh hey D O'Neill my man, I'm telling you right now, 80s vibes, that's where it's at. Everything. I'm retro synth everything all the time. I can't wait. Let's go. Ooh, Benjamin Gonzalez passed Net Plus over the weekend on to Sec Plus. Get it, get it, get it. Nice. Name cannot be blank. Love it. Oh, hey, let's, let's, Let's go, Decker. Let's go, Dakar. Welcome to the party, pal. Welcome to the party, pal. This is jaw jacking the, uh, you know, thing that we do at the end of uh, the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Brief on Monday, Wednesdays, Friday. Let's get Elf involved. <coughs> Excuse me. Nice, Justin Gold getting the Simply Cyber gear con merch. Sure, it's awesome. Oh, oh my God, that didn't taste good. Oh, oh my God, that's old water. I forgot. This is the fresh water. Oh, what the hell? It tastes like plastic. A manual passing the ISC 2-2. Very nice. All right, guys. That's going to do it for today's show. I want to thank all of you for being here. Shout out to the mods. Shout out to the Simply Cyber Squad members. 
Uh, we're going to be keeping it going strong tomorrow, 8 a.m. Eastern time. So holler at us if you can. Guys, I'm Jerry, your chat. Thanks all so very much. And until the next time, stay secure. Everybody, I hope you enjoyed that content. Keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other Simply Cyber community resources. We have the Discord server that's lively and always keeps the conversation going. You can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. And also every single weekday morning on the Simply Cyber channel, we're doing live daily cyber threat briefings, 8 a.m. Eastern time, as well as Thursday at 4.30 p.m. We're doing live stream interviews with industry experts, and we produce videos that we push out every Wednesday morning. I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber. I hope you enjoyed the content, and we'll see you in the next one one.